Vienna Humanities Festival. Uh, we are starting this uh, morning, this festival weekend, with a discussion about freedom of expression. And there is hardly a more relevant topic for this festival, which we started back in 2016 as a forum where we bring together intellectuals, writers, academics in the humanities, journalists, in order to rethink uh, our times uh, and, to, and the phenomena that, that shaped them. Uh, the format of the festival is uh, open to the general audience, so we are throwing their ideas uh, for open debate. Um, so this is to say that after we talk here for about 40 minutes, there will be a possibility for you to take part, ask questions uh, or reflect on what you have heard. Um, but why freedom of expression is uh, our topic uh, today? You might say, aren't we anyway uh, living in, aren't we part of this minority in the world that is living in democracies, and the freedom of expression is secured, so why bother? Well, we think that the challenges to freedom of expression are, uh, they're new and new challenges, uh, and they're constantly being redefined, so it is important precisely because the freedom of expression is so central to the functioning of our democracies, to reflect about the new types of challenges and the ways to overcome them. We are going to concentrate today on two types of challenges, one coming from the illiberal governments that are trying to silence independent voices, control the media, it is enough to mention here the assassination of journalists that we have been witnessing in recent uh, years uh, in Malta or Slovakia, or the control of media that we are witnessing, for example, in Hungary, Hungary in countries like Hungary, where allegedly about 80% of the media is under state control in one form or another. Correct me if I'm wrong later on. <laughs> Uh, but actually, it is not only um, Hungary, which is the most famous and notorious example that we read about all the time uh, in the media. I can say that in my own Bulgaria, the country I come from, uh, the last uh, period of about 12 years of political stability was also marked by uh, really complicated, sophisticated schemes that the government was using in order to control uh, media and the content, uh, its content and editorial policies. Uh, actually, Bulgaria ranks even worse than Hungary in terms of freedom of the media, um, which is um, peculiar, interesting. And on the other side, the other set of challenges uh, that we're going to talk about today has to do with the um, rise of the um, social media and social platforms, and the huge concentration of power actually in private hands and in the hands of private corporations, and the responsibilities that come with it, and the danger that these private corporations uh, start exercising censorship. We have two very distinguished speakers today. Um, incidentally, both of them coming from Hungary, but they met for the first time 10 minutes ago here. Uh, Veronika Munk is an award-winning Hungarian journalist, uh, the founding editor-in-chief and head of content development of the independent Hungarian online uh, news daily Telex. She used to be the deputy editor-in-chief at Index, which was Hungary's biggest online news daily, which in 2020, in the summer, uh, she, together with her team, left as a sign of protest of the government putting hand, actually, on the editorial policy of this media. Uh, and as a result, then, she created, together with her colleagues, the Telex, which is uh, now, actually, on a daily basis, reaffirming the right of free media and uh, free journalism in her country. Professor Andra Shayo is a former judge at the European Court of Human Rights, a professor at the Central European University, so he is going to be a more frequent guest of this city, um, starting from now. Uh, and he is a member of the Meta Oversight Board, Meta, which was previously known as Facebook. Uh, Professor Shayo has been extensively involved in legal drafting throughout Eastern Europe and he has taught in uh, American law schools uh, for a long time. 
and some of uh, his latest publications include the Rutledge Handbook of Illiberalism. So let us start, uh, Veronica, um, uh, with um, this. You have your career started in your country at times when uh, media in Hungary was more freer, more diverse. And throughout the years, you have witnessed how the space for independent journalism was shrinking. So can you reflect a little bit about what are the strategies of the government to put hold on independent media and to silence it? And how did the process evolve? And when was the moment when you realized that actually what is going on is dangerous and one has to do something about it? Thank you very much, Desi, and thank you for the invitation. I will use my phone not to text my family, but I have some, some uh, notes in it that I would like to use. Um, I think it's very illustrative if we have a look on the freedom of press list of the Reporters Without Borders. Uh, they publish every year this freedom of press index. And I started my career in 2002, and then Hungary was one of the countries in, top of the, in, in, in the top of this list. For instance, in 2006, Hungary was, I think, the 10th out of like 160 countries. Now we are uh, the 85th, uh, and the year before we was the 92nd. Uh, I think we are the worst in the EU, or no, maybe Bulgaria, maybe Bulgaria sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you, you, you beat us then. Uh, what, what, a, what a great thing to be second in this. Uh, um, but yeah, so, so when I started my career, uh, being a journalist in Hungary was a completely different thing than nowadays, and, and I experienced this dramatic change uh, how, how the freedom of press situation declined. Uh, to illustrate this, when in, in the beginning of the 2000s until, uh, until in the last 10 years, in the last decade basically, um, as I mentioned, we worked in a completely different circumstances. For instance, when we asked questions from the authorities, or from the government bodies, agencies, politicians, we almost uh, always got answers for our questions, and we were present at every press conferences, and, uh, and, uh, and, and TVs and newspapers and online outlets basically survived uh, only through the market-based advertisement. That was the past, and it's dramatically changed uh, because of, uh, in my opinion, five different factors. Uh, first was that uh, the Hungarian media landscape basically fractured to two distinct parts through ownership. The large majority of the outlets somehow not owned by, directly by the government or by politicians, but somehow through loyal businessmen, some one might call them oligarchs, um, they own the, the vast majority of, uh, of the media outlets, and, and there, are a, there, there are some of them, some of us, who are still independent of it. But this trend in the last 10 years that are more and more uh, media outlets fell into uh, uh, hands of business circles with close ties to the current political elite, it's constant. And, and this pro-governmental media conglomerate is very well organized. Uh, they have infinite resources versus this smaller critical media sphere that is mostly only online, somehow fragmented, competing with each other, and of course now, like everywhere in the world, hit by this uh, horrible <laughs> economic crisis. The second factor, or the second strategy, is regarding the public broadcasting companies, the public service media, which is basically, sounds like a megaphone of the government. Uh, and there are seven different TV broadcasters and five radio channels uh, and, and, and others belong to just to the public service 
broadcasting conglomerate. And this is not just the central. That it, this is not just the central one central agency for pro, pro governmental media sources. There is this large, very unique um, something called Keshma. Uh, in, the English name is Central European Press and Media Foundation, and around 500 media outlets. Uh, belong to this uh, foundation, which is supposed to be an independent creation, uh, but it's an institution, I think, with a pronounced government bias. Uh, there have been no such uh, media holding in Hungary since the communist era. And I think 500 media outlets is a lot. You can understand that. And the, so the level of this media concentration, I think it's unprecedented uh, in the world. Uh, and, and I think from the Western point of view, is, is basically, uh, even for us, unthinkable. The fourth factor uh, is that the Hungarian advertisement market somehow also uh, influenced by politics, which means that government-related outlets receive enormous amounts in state and state-controlled advertising, and those who are not allies uh, get none of it. When, remember, COVID started and all over the world there was this state advertisement regarding wash your hands because then it, it helps your health. And back then, when it happened, uh, we still worked at Index, which was really the largest and most influential outlet. We reached like 1.5 million readers a day, which is a lot in a country of 10 million. And, they, and we never got invited to, to tell this 1.5 million people a day that please wash your hands. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a good example that, that impact doesn't really matter. And the fifth um, factor is, and, and as an everyday life, and, and our everyday lives as, a, as journalists is the, is the most problematic at all, of all, is the access to information. You were talking about Malta and, and Slovakia. In Hungary, journalists are not put to prison and not being killed, luckily. But at the same time, it was never more difficult to, to fulfill this profession because it's really, really hard to access the information. Uh, and, and it's a constant experience to running up against brick walls when we, when we try to research, when we try to investi investigate, when we try to basically get answers to our questions. Um, and I don't want to keep uh, too much time, but this, these five strategies are the main ones uh, and do you think currently. This is all possible? What were the conditions that made this all gradual capture of the media uh, possible? Uh, it, was, it was a very clear political move uh, with a very clear political agenda that, uh, and somehow it's a clever move, it's working if you, if you see the, the election results in my country. Uh, that if you control the media, if you can spread the political message all around uh, in, in very different kind of media, in, in TV broadcasters, in female magazines, news outlets, etc., it's just effective. Mm -hmm. So that's that simple it is. Mm -hmm. Professor Shayo, as a human rights lawyer, how do you see the possible strategies to counteract this um, illiberal government's grasp on independent media? What is the role of the institutions, international institutions, like the European Commission, International Court of Human Rights? Um, is, are there um, the institutions? Are the institutions there? which can help prevent the liberal government of doing this, what we just heard the Hungarian government is doing? Well, you know, if I were to know the answer, I would uh, act along those lines that I cannot see. Well, you see, it's very difficult at this stage uh, for a country like Hungary. It, it's, unless there are external changes 
outside the country, it's hard to imagine. Now, not all the countries reach the level of Hungary. And there, I think that there are uh, possibilities, uh, but the possibilities are not built up. And that was also the tragedy of Hungary, that uh, <clears throat> institutional devices were not properly taken when uh, everybody thought that democracy will work very well. It didn't. So you can have institutions, you can have uh, very str strict rules, for example, how you depoliticize the judiciary, how you depoliticize the secret services, uh, how you protect the constitution against amendments, make, making uh, changes of a liberal constitution very burdensome. None of uh, that exists in Hungary, or existed, now they, it does exist exactly to maintain the status quo. But I think beyond the uh, unfinished uh, constitutionalization of the defense of a democracy, it's equally or even more so important uh, what is uh, in the mind, what is the spirit. And of course, all what was told about Hungary uh, regarding the media and journalists is true, but it's also true that there were so many willing journalists, editors, who jumped on this new bandwagon and were ready to support the government. And it's also true that <coughs> there were lawyers who were ready to, to carry out the plan. And that's, again, something that goes way beyond Hungary. So what matters is not just institutions which are not perfect could be improved, but it's equally or even more so important to have a living spirit, that people are committed. I'm not, I don't mean that they have to be heroes of, of democracy, but at least they should take a little risk. And that is what very often is missing, because people just take for granted that the system cannot go down. It does. But if there is a popular support for this government, for this party that is ruling, um, and you're saying there are other judges and different people from sectors of society supporting these moves, does this make these uh, measures uh, legitimate? Uh, it is not very fair to blame the people for what kind of democracy they have. But I wouldn't say that the people is not responsible for what they have. So, you know, there are bad guys, and then here we are, the rest. We are not bad, not good, but we should try a little more not to be bad. And what are the social reasons for people acquiescing? Yes, in, in Hungary or in many other countries, People are increasingly dependent of the state. It's true that uh, in the last 12 years, the number of people directly dependent on state, both business and, and ordinary teachers, all of them are dependent on the state. So at this moment, it's, it takes a serious risk to stand up, not in terms of going to jail at the moment, but at least in the sense of losing your job, which just happened. Uh, yesterday in Hungary regarding uh, uh, high school teachers who dare to say something. So it's very hard to say you should stand up. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in many sense uh, enjoying my pension, so I'm in a different position and it wouldn't be fair to tell them to go out, but you know, it's still something of a matter of civil courage. Veronica, but you did stand up. It seems to me, when you left uh, Index and decided to create another media which would be independent, can you a little bit reflect on, um, yes, these pockets, even if they are minor minority in society, that are exercising resistance, and in what way are they doing this? And is there a hope in journalists, in civil society? Yeah, we, we did stand up. We, we quit, all of us, 90 of us quit on a single day after Sabolj Dual, editor-in-chief, was fired from Index. But I'd like to stress out that I don't like when our story and our team is being portrayed and talk about like, uh, resist, re, like some kind of resistment 
against the government, but we, we are not political actors. I don't like that somebody, someone put us in that position. We are journalists who, who just wanted to fulfill this profession that we passionately believe in, that we would like to provide the fact-based news and quality media for people, that we knew that there is a demand for it and our story that we created. So yeah, we, we, we stood up together. And it was unique. After the day we quit, there was this large, large pro protest on the streets of Budapest, and, and thousands of people were marching on the street because Index, our previous workplace, was really, really influential. Everyone read it if they wanted to have credible news. So our only... The only thought was that, okay, the, the, the largest uh, possible mistake is that if we do not try. So we, we tried and we, together, we founded Telex, which, is, which was based slowly on crowdfunding. We thought that, okay, we tried this version when the owner is some rich guy, uh, now we turn to the readers and we, journalists, gonna be the owners and we just we just t told to our audience that, look, guys, you know us. We have been doing this job since in the last two decades, and we want to continue it, not because of this very activist type of uh, move, but, but for giving facts to you. So please give us money. It was a more sophisticated way how we communicated, of course, but, but still the message was that, and they did. Uh, we got 1 million euros in a month uh, through crowdfunding, so we could start it Telex just two months after we quit Index. And Telex is two years old tomorrow. That's our second birthday. And it's working. This model is working. Uh, there are still enough people in Hungary who, who are willing to contribute financially uh, because they would like to consume facts, and not just at Telex, because I have to mention that there are other independent, mostly online outlets. All of them somehow rely on readers' revenue, because, because in the end of the day, journalistic independency relies on, on economical financial independency. So that's, that's a really important thing in the future, that how we can maintain this uh, stability. Mm -hmm. But usually when there is a crisis, um, as there was in the summer of 2020, people are willing to take part and to donate, etc. But how is what is happening over the years? It's two years mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Is this strength of support continuing? And do you think it's a sustainable model, what you're having? I think the best marketing is a good content and good journalism. So yes, you are right. The big story that do oh, these cute guys stood up gonna fade. But if we can provide uh, quality journalism for people, today there are 600,000 readers a day at Telex, which is a lot, and 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 there are more than 50,000 people who who contributed financially to, to, to run Telex, basically. So I, I can say that we do have advertisement as well, and we, we would like to grow as many legs as possible. <laughs> and based on this very strong um, story we had, uh, I can say that, yes, it is sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm believing it, of course. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do that if I won't believe yeah. it. Moving to the social media and to Meta, um, can you tell us at the beginning what is the Meta Oversight Board doing? Uh, Facebook, as it was called at the time, realized that they are under a very serious criticism uh, for uh, whatever they do. If they silence someone or if they allow someone to speak, there was no right way to, to come out of it. Someone was always offended. Now, on top of that, Facebook promised, uh, as, as a fundamental service, a kind of safe space, whatever it means. So the idea to have a safe space where no one is troubled, and the idea that they are uh, enabling people to have a voice, which was another promise of Facebook, these two 
became more and more controversial and contradictory. And uh, at a certain point, uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg was uh, advised to set up what at that time was believed to be a, supreme, a worldwide Supreme Court working for uh, Facebook independently. Because, uh, and that means that they established a, a separate fund. They don't control the money. And uh, we have a, a board supervising the activity. So if we find that a, a post was taken down in violation of Facebook standards or in violation of human, international human rights, they have to restore. And in addition, uh, we have also uh, the possibility to, to advise them uh, regarding policies. So these are the activities we take. The standard we apply is primarily international human rights law. But that's exactly where the difficulty lies, because international human rights law is not crystal clear. So it, it stands for a freedom of expression. But at the other, uh, on the other side, of course, freedom of, of expression is not absolute. And in particular, um, incitement, of course, uh, is, pro is rightly prohibited. Now, there is a gray zone, which is called generally hate speech. But hate speech has so many meanings that really you, you get into trouble when you try to enforce it. So, you know, uh, for some people, uh, uh, hate speech is just telling the truth about a certain form of oppression. For others, this is just uh, incitement based on racial or other considerations. So this creates a, a enormous tension. And the uh, Oversight Board is, is trying to find a, a, a well, middle road, if you wish, although I think we have a mandate to stand as much as possible favoring a freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. But again, freedom of expression has certain limits. But what is the level that you're working on? Because you're not involved, as far as I know, on the day-to-day -day, uh, right. community so standards moderation. So and this, how is this being done? Uh, this, this board at the moment has about 20-some members, should have uh, 40 at the end of the road. It goes extremely slowly, COVID, etc. And we take only those cases which, which are particularly important from the perspective of freedom of expression, which means that there are uh, millions of complaints addressed to Facebook. Some of them are remedied. Many others are not. Um, they have the right to appeal to the oversight board if it's taken down. But then, of course, as I mentioned, we take only very few cases because of, of the uh, capacity. We are not full-time workers of, of this foundation. Uh, we also have our independence vis-a-vis -vis the foundation. Uh, so we have other uh, means of, of livelihood, not full-time. And so, as I say, very few appeals are accepted by the oversight board. Can uh, you give us an example? What type of appeals would be accepted by the board? Well, we, we have rendered in two years maybe f something close to 40 uh, decisions. In reality, the impact is, is slightly, I mean, these have uh, enormous impact because these are crucial issues. So we say something about the, the uh, civil war in Ethiopia. It is just one post that was, I don't want to enter into details. You can read it. We have a website where all the decisions are published. Now, whatever we decided regarding that uh, matter applies to all the information regarding uh, Ethiopian civil war. And it applies, as far as uh, Facebook is concerned, to other civil wars where the situation is similar. So it has a, a major impact, at least I hope so. Uh, but, uh, or we have another case now, COVID. Obviously, we decided one case. There is now a policy uh, uh, decision in preparation. So that will determine how 
COVID misinformation is to be treated or what amounts to misinformation. So it's, it, it's really the, the uh, additional effect that matters. Not, unfortunately, we cannot provide justice to all the users, mm -hmm. but it is really to shape the policy. So you're defining the standards according right. to which the moderation is being done on yeah. a daily basis. Right. And how right. is it being done on a daily basis? Is it uh, artificial okay, intelligence so or is it individuals? <laughs> that I'm asking is because there's so many cases where people are complaining of being censored by, by Facebook. So I have seen you know, posts where it says this content was not true, so it's removed, and people are complaining because, in their opinion, yeah. it was completely correct information. And then even, even worse when they lose their access as such, so they, they are, yeah, they can as, be as, banned, as yeah. users, are denied access. By the way, we don't have power to review those decisions at the moment. So the problem, and this is where social media regulation becomes a worldwide problem. Uh, you have billions of clicks per day, right? No human capacity exists to deal with it. So who is doing this? It is an algorithm. What is in the algorithm? We don't know. I read in, 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 in the papers that not even Facebook knows it. I, I have absolutely no information on this. I just quote what I read. So at a certain point, they, they lose track. Uh, the whole concept that, I, that we understand, the whole concept differs from human decision making because it's not about individual causation, it's about risk taking. It's statistical risk taking, okay? So they can adjust the acceptable level of risk, which means that hundreds of thousands of similar statements will fall in the same category. But of course, the conditions are different. So to say something that uh, group X in, in Ethiopia is killing us, group Z, is said in a very specific context where there is an armed conflict going on. Now, what if the same words are uttered in a different context where they are not yet killing each other or where there is no such story or the story is 50 years old. We had a similar case regarding uh, the, uh, the expulsion of, of uh, Serbs from a Croat territory, but the, the expulsion happened 50 years or, f no, not 50 years, 100 years and 70 years and 40 years ago and 20 years ago. So how these two compare? This is left to the algorithm. The algorithm does at the moment cannot take into consideration all those specificities, but right? And that's where, where this is a completely new, new word for, for freedom of expression. But don't you think that the Meta Oversight Board should have the right to determine the rules of this algorithm? Well, the, the part of this is proprietary. So, it's, you know, the, the most valuable thing that if it's disclosed to us, we won't understand, first of all. I, I for sure won't understand. Even if you understand. It can be explained you, in We understand language, the logic, but how are we going to tinker? They have thousands of engineers to tinker with it. And they do. Mm -hmm. It's no question mm -hmm. about it. They work mm -hmm. very diligently. Mm -hmm. We have evidence mm -hmm. of that. So they try to adjust it. And do you think that small languages are disadvantaged? Because in English, for example, or Spanish, you have a huge accumulation of cases, and it's a language that is apparently generating more clicks. So basically, probably the regulations of this algorithm could be better fine-tuned there As than I in say, other they, small they languages. Do, they do this fine-tuning regularly, and we have some data with, with really considerable financial effort in it. So it's not that you, you that they are idle. No, not at all. I was just giving the sign that we have about five minutes right. more and then there is time for Q&A, so get ready to ask your questions. Uh, but um, I wanted to ask you also, how do you deal on the uh, Meta Oversight Board with fake news, disinformation, with government's attempt to influence elections in other countries? Is this also something that you are yes, dealing with? Yes, that's one of the big issues we deal with, Facebook as such, or Meta now. They have dedicated groups to deal with it. 
uh, they love to outsource this, so they use all sorts of uh, trusted partners to determine, mm -hmm. uh, which is another source of, of problems because this is always challenged, uh, whether they are objective or not. Now, the uh, most uh, spectacular example, as I mentioned, this is the COVID-related uh, efforts of, of uh, Facebook. And very briefly, I just exposed the, the difficulty. So the, imagine that uh, there is a, an advice given by WHO, Facebook or Meta takes that word by word. Now, what if three months later, WHO comes to a different conclusion? Are you going to restore it? Was the or original takedown appropriate or not? Very often, this is not compatible with human rights norm because there ought to be direct causation of harm. And then there is a debate whether it is appropriate to introduce a lockdown. It's not yet in the public debate. And the WHO says, well, perhaps that's the position, or that was the position of, of uh, WHO. They had contradictory positions, saying that in some circumstances it poses too much uh, burden on, on the poorest, which was true. But others said in WHO that lockdown is the only way out in the situation. So what is misinformation in those circumstances when you just debate the introduction of a policy? Are you going to silence all those who have uh, uh, doubts about the policy? So all I'm saying, this is not just a question of algorithm or even sound uh, uh, judgment, because it, it changes all the time. And that's where the concept of misinformation is people take for granted. Oh, here is truth, here is misinformation, and you, you just, the, the water is parted, right? That's not how it works. Mm. Uh, I would like to open now for, for your questions, so please show me by hand, raising a hand if there is a question. So there is one uh, on the back there, and then further to the front, yeah. Please. Uh, Mr. Sayo, uh, uh, just taking up your comment on the alleged expulsion of Serbs from Croatia, in light of the fact that Gotovina was found not guilty by The Hague in light of the fact that evidence has shown that Serb leaders practiced and told the population of the Kraina to leave. What evidence do you have of expulsion? Uh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I have a technical difficulty because in a way we are in this... Uh, the microphones are in, uh, directed at it. So I, I understand you asked about the, the Serbo-Croat problem, but I, uh, right? If you can shortly repeat the question, the, the essence of it, what is the evidence they have in order to take the decision in this case? Is the, was you this mentioned the expulsion of Serbs by Croats in light of the fact that General Gotovina was found not guilty by The Hague ah. in 2012. Mm -hmm. Where is your evidence for this assertion? Yeah, so uh, the, the specific case that we had was not about whether someone was responsible or not. So we didn't have to go into that, uh, which would have caused enormous legal difficulties. Uh, the case was simply decided on the fact what were the means used to expel uh, people, and then whether the actual post was a clear enough reference to the expulsion, which was irrespective of the responsibility of the military, uh, uh, occurred in, in a forcible way. So I think the individual responsibility was one thing, and the fact that people had to leave uh, they village. That was a different story. And we were only concerned about that fact or actually their allegations made in a specific song in, in that case. So we were safe enough not to get into the 
uh, international criminal law part of the story. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, first of all, I'm sorry I arrived a few minutes late, so forgive me if uh, what I'm about to ask has already been covered. When President Joe Biden took office, one of the things he said was, diplomacy is back. And a few months later, he said openly, the whole world knew it, um, President, um, by, uh, President Putin is a murderer. So from the point of view of freedom of expression, he was allowed to say it, but from the point of view of diplomacy, it was rather unwise and possibly dangerous. So what in your view is the borderline, the gray line between diplomacy and freedom of expression? I don't really heard the question, actually. Oh, really, really. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so regarding how uh, freedom of expression and the connection to, to diplomacy. Mm. Yeah, sorry, the sound is really strange. <laughs> Uh, uh, so w when President Biden took off yeah. office, uh, one of the things he said was diplomacy is back. And then a few months later, he openly called um, uh, um, President Putin a murderer. So from the point of view of freedom of expression, he's allowed to say what he thinks. But from the point of view of diplomacy, this was rather unwise and possibly dangerous. So what in your view is the gray line, the border line between freedom of expression and diplomacy. Mm -hmm. uh, from the journalistic point of view, it, it is newsworthy. So from the journalistic point of view, if the, this prominency element that, that the, the, the new president says something like that uh, will, be, will be presented in the media. But, uh, yeah, but I think it's a totally other aspect if it would be analyzed by the board or, I don't know, so yeah. From the jur journalistic perspective, it is hard news. I think it's a question more for political scientists to answer rather than journalists. Uh, there is a question here and another here. Thank you very much for a fascinating panel. My question is about the difference between uh, the countryside and the cities. We know that in spite of Viktor Orban's uh, leadership uh, of the country, that the capital city Budapest is in the hands of the opposition. What are the differences between urban and rural ways of informing oneself? Okay. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you very much. And there is a large difference uh, of the access to, to, to the public uh, um, information, uh, especially if someone do not consume the news online. Because when the media was captured, the county newspapers, was all of the county newspapers held, uh, f fell into the hands of the pro-governmental business circles. This foundation I mentioned that owns 500 outlets, they own all of the county newspapers, printed ones that traditionally uh, read by people who are not living in cities, uh, but uh, in, in smaller towns or on, on or in villages, that's, that's where the government's voters basically are. Uh, and when I mentioned uh, that the Hungarian freedom of press situation is, a, is in a bad shape, I mentioned that the media pluralism basically exists online, and people who live in villages or elderly people, they just don't consume, uh, not all of them, of course, there are people who, who like to read uh, online uh, outlets, but, but the, generally speaking, uh, they, they don't consume these, these still independent uh, outlets. Th therefore, there are some attempts to, to find a way uh, to, to deal with this situation. For instance, we at Telex, we started to build 
a local correspondent network in, in cities outside of Budapest, so we can give local stories on Telex, so people can, can, can find from Győr, from Szeged, from Pécs, from very, we have five different locations where we have our own correspondents, and uh, therefore we try to, try to give a different kind of uh, um, information to people that they can get from pro-governmental um, uh, media. Uh, and there are other attempts similar like that uh, because, because it was widely uh, understood that, uh, that if people do not get that much chance to, to consume information but the messages which is pro-governmental, then it can have a problematic effect on the society. <coughs> there is a question there and then... So thank you very much for the lovely discussion. My question has to do with um, sensationalism in the in the media. We have uh, we see this tendency in the U.S. that the media landscape is more and more por polarized. In my home country of Romania, it's the same. There are a lot of private media outlets that always sing the song of one political party and try to slander the other one. And I remember, I, I also speak Hungarian, by the way, so I remember that um, it was a similar media landscape around 10 years ago in Hungary, very polarized. And I wonder to what extent people lose trust in a free media landscape when the media becomes very much about slandering the other side and much less about clear policy. So less about informing people. It's a free media landscape, but it becomes much less about informing people and much more about beating down the other side. This to me seems to create conditions in which then people want to embrace a more um, universal message like what ended up happening in Hungary. <laughs> so I don't know. My question is then has to do how can we combat this sort of situation from evolving? Is there any mechanism for this? I would say the same thing that I said before, that uh, the structure you described is, is so bipolar that there are these pro-governmental media and oppositional media. And I oppose this because I don't think that all of the critical independent one, oppositional ones at the same time. Uh, there are media which is impartial. Impartiality and objectivity, of course, very theoretical and constructed phenomena which, uh, uh, which really hard to achieve, but at the same time, not all of the media outlets are t tied hands with, with, with oppositional parties, so to say. And, not the, and the purpose is not to beat each other, but to inform people, being curious, being fair. So I think that's the answer. That's what we're trying to do at Telex, for instance. Uh, and, and, and we have the audience, basically, because they want to have this kind of uh, uh, news product in Hungarian language, also in English. That's the, we have an English language section that is the part for the advertisement. If you want to read Hungarian news in English, just have a look at Telex. So my answer is that that's the answer to be in the middle as much as possible. Yeah, but there was one aspect, I think, in the question that I also was curious about. And don't you think that this situation where you have media outlets serving one or another party, as you said in Romania, same in Bulgaria and other countries, of course, uh, that this um, erodes the trust in the, in the institution yeah, of media yeah, yeah, that's in I general? Yeah, that's correct. That, I didn't answer that part, and sorry. This a very, for me, this is the biggest problem, actually, that it, yeah. the trust in the institutions of the media, because when you don't have this trust, then every information is considered as equally mm, plausible, uh, legitimate to be there, out there, and I actually then the social medias are helping every true, not true, false, uh, manipulative, uh, deliberately manipulative, manipulative information to be spread. Uh, and this actually is the end of the trust in the media, it seems to me. It is declining, the trust, but I think it's a global phenomenon. 
I don't think that there is anyone in the room who would say that if there is a public opinion poll in the country that which are the most trusted positions and which are the least, journalists would not, in the end of this uh, section, just because of this sense, what's the word in English you said, sensationalization? <laughs> sorry, my, my, sorry uh, that I could not pronounce it. Uh, and because of clickbait uh, uh, titles and clickbait stories. So yeah, yeah, that's a trend we experience and we try to fight against it with facts. And is our social media for you an enemy or an ally in your work? I would say it's an addictive love-hate relationship <laughs> from, from a news outlet's point of view because it's a dependent relationship because people read news through social media. It's, uh, for instance, Telex's audience is coming through social media, the majority of it. Of course, there are a large proportion of people who type telex.hu and they read it from, from that, but mostly from Facebook, from Instagram, from TikTok, from YouTube, we are everywhere. Yes, but then your content is flowing in the sea of all other kinds of information. Yeah, right? and we don't know the algorithm. And we are, we are basically the young sisters of this algorithm. And, and if, our, if our brother wants to turn something or align something which we don't know of, we just sometimes we realize that our audience is dropping with the same content we provide. And therefore, yeah, it is, it is, uh, Double -edged it, is, it is the origin of our existence somehow because that's how our audience is growing and, and, and there. And in the other side, they, it, it could kill us in a second. I think we have time for one or maximum two. Okay, let's take the two last questions together and we round up here and there. I wanted to ask a question about Google Trends. Um, media managers around the world are using Google Trends to find out what their readers want to know. So what is the position um, at, uh, at, at your um, media outlet? Do you, do you consider Google Trends as a source of what people want to read? And do you see movements inside Hungary who want this information that you supply? You mean Google Trends, right? Yeah. Uh, no because we would write about uh, recipes, cute kittens, uh, and uh, <laughs> of course, we, uh, I'm, I'm joking now, of course we, ha we, have, we have a look on, on what people search for, uh, but, but, but in the other hand, news, the element of newsworthiness, I think rather differs on, on what people is looking in searching in, on Google. So it, uh, according to our editorial standards, it's not in our focus. Yeah. There's a question there. Thanks. Um, on one hand, you have the freedom of speech. And on the other hand, there is uh, the freedom of artistic as expression. As we know, uh, there are a lot of uh, not direct restrictions, but uh, to employment and loss of jobs and uh, policy of who leads theaters in, in, in Hungary, uh, that there are also many restrictions of artistic freedom. Are you connected with this scene, with people fighting for that? We write about them. Uh, if, if of, of course, that's large news in Hungary and we, we cover it as a news. But again, we are not, um, I mean, we are not involving as an activist type of involvement. We be covering the stories regarding it and give it a voice, let people know what's happening. Maybe one last question, if it's very short. Thanks very much. Very short question to Andras Sajo. Uh, you, you said that um, you don't need to necessarily be a hero of democracy, you just need to be a little more courageous. 
uh, at times, p humans, I mean, uh, citizens. And I was wondering, as, as societies become less and less liberal or liberalism grows, how does one try a little harder, as you said, as, as a citizen? Uh, well, frankly, I don't know, but what I have in mind is uh, just uh, the kind of professionalism that was mentioned. And I know a little bit more about uh, 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 judges. And of course, the judge can have very different approaches within his, uh, his or her professional work. So you can interpret a text uh, in many ways. You can uh, determine the sequence of cases in many ways. That's within your uh, power. But of course, if you are interested in your personal career, then you will try to figure out which case to take first in order to please the superior in your court because he will decide on the advancement. By the way, here comes the uh, institutional part because if it is not your court president who will determine your career advancement, then this uh, uh, carrot is not there anymore. But still, it matters how you, you, you consider your own work. And it is here that resilience may build up. Same with teachers who, of course, in, in a country like Hungary, more and more have to follow a predetermined curriculum. But still, in the classroom, you have a certain freedom to, to, to discuss a certain historical event or to tell students, oh, here are three ways to interpret this, this piece of poetry. And you can smuggle in at least one meaning that is perhaps not in line with what the government or the uh, the educational supervisor expects you to, to do. So it, it is at this level that one can still do things. It's limited, but still it matters. And to what extent this works that way, that's where, where the, the difficulty lies. Andres Sayo, Veronica Munk, thank you very much for this talk. Thank you.